Miss Von der Rohe, you can see and hear the deceased who are around us. Can you explain to me how one can imagine such a perception? Well, that's easier to explain by means of an example. If someone's eyesight is very poor, then they might sense when someone is nearby, whereupon they become aware and look in that direction, then seeing a kind of blurred shape or shapes, they put on their glasses, and then they can see more clearly. And that's also how it is when I perceive that spirit beings are around me. And as far as I'm concerned, if I have time, in those moments, I switch on my spiritual perception, and so see it more clearly. And if the situation is favorable, I may also ask them questions, or it might also happen that it is the spiritual being talking to me from the start anyway, and then I react accordingly. That's roughly how it works. You can also ignore these spirit beings, is that right? Yes, of course. There are so many beings around us, and if you were to turn toward everyone, and there are also those who want to push themselves forward, and that's why those apparitions have to be sorted out carefully. Tell me, why are there spirit beings who would rather be around people than go toward the other world where their predeceased relatives are? Well, you have to imagine it like this. Many of those deceased do not know about their situation. And then, when they have died, they are totally confused. And though their guardian angel leads them into the spiritual plane of the hereafter, everything is still completely foreign to them. And this may be the reason why they return to Earth, because they know their way around there. Actually, that's often their motivation. May I give you some examples for this? Uh, once, while on a hike, I saw a deceased person, and I asked him casually, you know that you have died, and in response he said, no, I didn't die, I'm quite alive. Then I said, but you do remember your funeral service, don't you? And he assured me, yes, of course, I once dreamt something like that, but no, I'm alive. Although he was standing here by the wayside, only in spirit, and he then also told me that he had had a heart attack, and that now he simply would have to wait here until the condition has improved again. How clearly can you perceive these spirit beings? It does vary. The visual acuity varies. I'll put it that way. Sometimes I also feel that my guardian spirit puts a certain energy cloud over my head, whereupon it all feels somewhat intensified. And in case you get involved in it, then you get involved in the subtle level. And then you can see it all quite well, but you nevertheless know very well that the course, the density, is no longer present. Well, you perceive it all as something somewhat finer, also finer than a soul that you would still describe as somewhat course. So this is then all finer. And transparent, you can't really say, but it is a first approach to describe it in this way. Let's go back to the person you met when you were hiking. The thinking is still exactly the same as when the deceased individual was alive. That is, if someone does not believe in a life after death, then these people do not accept that now they are in a different place altogether. Yes, that's how it is. Unfortunately, very many souls have difficulties with such a point of view. They neither believe in a beyond, nor do they believe in life after death. So they say to themselves, I am here, I am really here, and therefore I did not die. One could have a long discussion concerning this issue, and I myself usually turn away, or I am involved in other concerns of my friends, and then both life and the hike go on. But actually, it is a matter of serious concern how few of the deceased realize immediately, now I have died. That's why all the deceased should attend their own funeral service, where I also was having some rather funny experiences. For example, when sometimes they were standing in front by the altar from where some wanted to escape, but their guard in spirit held them by the collar at the back in the sense of you stay here now so that they really are aware that they have died because realizing this is not self-evident since you still have a body even though a spiritual one you see your own limbs like your hands and so on so it is indeed difficult to grasp and say now I have died does it help these spirit beings to be with people long after they die 
Well, over time, I realized that this is actually very helpful. And when they arrive in the world beyond, they see this and that. And maybe there is a spirit being there that would like to instruct them. There are also deceased relatives who, after death, well, mostly if someone has lived reasonably well, he is met by his deceased relatives who then explain this and that to him. But some of them just do not want to accept it. And so they go back to the earth and then on earth, they are actually somewhat lonely and alone. And they move around then. And it goes without saying that there are only a few people who talk to them. And so they are simply in a state where they observe learning through their own experiences, through visual instruction, I might say. And this is something they can no longer deny. Then. Also, when realizing that people just don't see them and that no one sees them, neither at work nor at home, so they themselves become well aware of the fact that they have passed away. Also, when they pick up people's thoughts, thus knowing who is lying or what else is being thought, and this is really the best visual instruction. These spirit beings often talk to you when they realize that you can see and hear them. What concerns do these deceased have? And can you describe some encounters with them? Well, there are all sorts of things that I can hear from them. Many of the deceased are amazed, and some are very dissatisfied. And often they say, I imagine the hereafter and the heavens quite differently. This and something similar is what they say. A concrete example from the last time is when an, an acquaintance died and I saw him constantly walking around in the house and in the garden where he had lived previously. And every now and then, you don't look all the time, but each time when I did look, I saw him still in his house and garden. And at some point, he was no longer there. I then thought about it a bit and came to the conclusion. Three months ago, he passed away. And that's something we often notice, that you let the deceased stay for three months and they are then picked up, you might say. Maybe it doesn't always happen like this, but it all is based on what I have experienced up to now concerning this issue. And then I told his widow what I saw. And I said to her, I'm sharing this with you now. I found that your deceased husband was constantly with you in your house and garden, and now I don't see him anymore. Whereupon she said, yes, indeed, I constantly felt his presence. I kept asking him if he agreed with how I have arranged the garden, and I also asked him about this and that. Yes, really, I constantly felt him. And after exactly three months, he was gone. And so I thought to myself, well, I guess he's over there now. And at some point, he suddenly stood in our house saying, they won't let me go anywhere. The paths are blocked everywhere. I have nowhere to go. So I thought to myself, this is someone who had no faith in God. He further said, well, you could have told me during my lifetime that life goes on. You know so much about it. You have so many books. You should have told me. Then I just looked at him and he said, well, I know. I wouldn't have listened to you anyway. Then he said again, but you have books, whereupon the encounter was actually finished at that moment. However, this kept me thinking about that. So my guardian spirit later told me that I could tell his widow that I would like to give her two very important books and that she could read to him from these books. And he would still have nine months to be able to learn from these books because he just thought that I had withheld something from him. And she then came to me and was happy to take these books. At first, I had scruples. I still doubted whether I should tell his widow at all that her husband was in the house and all that. However, she then told me that she still had some knowledge from her youthful years when she was working in a team along with an elderly gentleman who said that he often would have a tape recorder of very high quality positioned in empty rooms. And thereafter, he would listen to it. And then one could hear spirit beings speaking. So one could see that the room was empty. But nevertheless, the speaking 
was being heard. And he sometimes demonstrated all this to them back then, and that's why it was not such a strange world for her. Well, she read to him from these books. During this time, I was away in hospital, where I saw him from afar. And when I looked at him a bit surprised, he said to me, I'm allowed to be here. I'm allowed to be here in order to learn. Another recent example, I went to the funeral service of a friend who had passed away and where I made some efforts to pray for him. And often these deceased people respond when a cloud of energy comes to them that provides some spiritual sense of well-being. But there was no response from this person. Later on, he came to our home. Then I first immediately praised his beautiful funeral service, as well as the trombonist who were playing wonderful music there. Whereupon, however, he said something dejectedly. I wasn't allowed to hear the trombonist. And when I gave him a questioning look, he said that he had had heated discussions with his guardian spirit before the funeral service, and that he was probably punished by him for that by having blocked out the trombones, so he was not allowed to hear these pieces of music. Did you have any other encounters with deceased people? Well, there was also something to smile about. There was another one who was sitting on a restaurant staircase. And when I passed him, I actually just said to myself, that's one of those souls wandering about. Then, the, then this one said, I'm not wandering, I am sitting here. And then there was also a little old granny who told me something. I have also had more serious experiences where, for example, one of them said to me, I want to tell my loved ones so many things, but they don't hear me and they do not see me, and that makes me sad. Or another example, an acquaintance who had again and again been around me, but who also visited other acquaintances in their homes. They recently had gotten together and they lived there together so that he was no longer with me, but in the house next door. Suddenly, he was no longer there either. So I asked my guardian spirit, isn't he still there? Where has he gone now? And the answer came, well, he evoked a deceiving impression. And so we had to take him away. So I asked him, evoked a deceiving impression? What does that mean? Didn't he say anything further? And I asked him again, whereupon he said then, well, if that's what you are dying to know, I will tell you. He said to me, you just have to keep giving this woman money and she will be happy again for a while. This was then the reason why this man, whom I knew, was taken away from there. Because in this case, false inspirations like this were out of place. You have mentioned your guardian spirit. How can you tell that it is a guardian spirit, and what is the task of this guardian spirit? Since Christ's redemption, every human being has a guardian spirit, as we also know from literature. And this guardian angel must guide and accompany us and protect us, and he may also inspire us. However, since man's free will is the highest good, this guardian spirit must always distinguish to what extent he is allowed to inspire a human being and to what extent he must allow man his free will. Can you see this guardian spirit too? Well, the helpers are the ones you can see very well, but the guardian spirits are located in a higher sphere, so you can see them less well, also less often, because they are much more subtle in nature. But usually in classes or courses, it is taught that they show themselves when it is important and instructive. They don't show themselves to us in order to draw attention to themselves, so to speak. It is we that see it all. The guardian spirit merely contribute their share, and we can see them if we are allowed to see them. So one cannot see every spirit being equally well. No, it's usual that the coarser ones are put forward as helpers on earth, because an angel has much finer vibrations, and for this reason he has his helpers, whom he sends forward so that they can help him with this and that. Once I saw one of the helpers fulfill his task of constantly accompanying a disabled child. These are still earthbound beings who can do this, even with the strength they still have. 
Miss Vondero, you can see and hear these spirit beings. Were there also people in the past who have had such experiences? Yes, of course. If one reads the literature attentively, one finds again and again such articles of people reporting about this. What seems important to me is that no one really knows why he is on this earth. But more than 400 years before Christ, the ancient Greeks knew that people come to this earth with a life plan and that there are various tasks that one should fulfill as well as possible and to live through the different stations of life aware of its meaningfulness and that it takes multiple earth lives to simply become more and more noble and finer and finer so that we can ascend at some point and that one was such a good and noble man on earth that one can return to a very high spiritual level over there, to where we once were, to put it very clearly, where the fall of the angels took place. And we now have to work our way back up there. You titled your new book, What Are We Here on Earth For? What is your answer to this question? Well, that we should recognize the deeper meaning of life and not just make a career and keep up appearances and all these things, but that we can live socially and help others in need. So we should focus more on these social things rather than on success and glamour and bling bling. Because we can't score with that over there. Because when we arrive over there, the only things that count are if we have done good, where we have been superficial or where we may have done evil. So we actually would like to be able to show as much good social positive factors as possible. And all this will be carefully weighed. And so there are always so many indicators where people are, were dissatisfied with life on earth. And it is often said that no one ever indicated what the meaning of earth life is. And some have also criticized it aloud. Why has no one told us what the meaning of life on earth is? As for me, I just wrote down what the beings said. I didn't add anything. I just thought to myself, it's difficult and I'll write it all down for now. I'll choose some of the experiences. And so I made them into a book because I just felt urged to... The way you describe it, there are always many spiritual beings around us humans. Do we have to be afraid of these spirits? No, actually not. Just as all those around us are average people, so are average souls around us. They sit around, observe, and maybe learn something from what happened. But if there are beings around us spreading a certain heaviness or something like that, then you should be careful. You can pray, then the worst ones keep their distance. The others stay. Because as a rule, praying is conveying, because as a rule, praying is conveying a certain feeling of well-being. You spoke of beings radiating a certain heaviness, a certain darkness. What is your opinion as to why these are around us? Well, of course, there are a great many unhappy souls. Once I had a client who said she prayed a lot for the poor souls, but how it was almost too much for her because she felt like her whole apartment was full of poor souls and that this would make her feel uncomfortable. So I explained to her that she should say to these souls, I will pray for you if you stay down in the garden where children and adults cannot go. Then I'll pray for you all but only if you do so. Something like that is comparable to a soup kitchen, so you just go where you can get something. And this then worked very well. She then had the feeling that her home was again bright and light as it should be. Do these souls benefit from prayer? Yes, for sure. A prayer is comparable to a cloud consisting of well-being. When I, for example, pray for souls and then look at them, I perceive that some open their jacket Others inhale, still others look at this cloud. But when I ask for heavenly power for an ignorant soul, 
and then those beautiful clouds of light appear, those kind of souls even make a refusing gesture because they don't want that, because they don't know what it is or that it could do them good. One can experience all of these things, but the majority of souls really absorb that greedily, this power of prayer, giving them a sense of well-being. And that's also when you have relatives over there and you pray for them. It gives them a sense of well-being. Often, they feel or find out who is praying for them. And it is something very important that you don't just think, he's dead now, so he is no longer here. Instead, it's important to think, oh yes, now I am thinking of you again. I wish you so much of the bright light and strength for your future path. For example, even if this is only a very short message, it has a really good effect, and this being will enjoy it. You have also written another book about a child who is clairvoyant. What was the key experience for you to write this book? Well, the beginning is quite far back. At that time, we had a clairvoyant child in our midst. All this was new to me, and in order to become someone to talk to, for this child, I then searched for the relevant literature in several bookstores, and I was then able to have many good discussions with this child, and as for me, this was greatly enriching for me. Later on, I realized that also in our region, there are various people dealing with otherworldly or so-called invisible things. So we founded a group called Instructions in Extrasensory Perceptions and these books came out of it. I also talked to this woman, who is now an adult, and we came to the conclusion that there should be also something for children, so that a child might be able to read, and that there are clairvoyant children, so that they can become clear about what I see others probably do not see, and that this book could perhaps also be something for adults. This woman then agreed to write this booklet together with me, and on the cover it is also written for ages 9 to 99. Elizabeth von der Rohe, thank you very much for the interview.